All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, welcome to our introduction to Fiberflex. Today we'll be joined by Buddy Oliver and Kyle Rosenblum to go over Patton's newest line of Fiberflex brand products. At any time during this presentation, if you have questions, please type them in the bottom right corner under questions and we'll get to them either during the presentation or at the end. Uh, thanks again for joining us this evening and I'm now going to hand this webinar over to Kyle and Buddy. Johnny, I don't have your screen on this side. There we are. Well, hello, everybody. <laughs> Welcome. This is uh, a introduction to Fiberplex. Uh, we're talking about the how fiber is the future, and even for legacy solutions. So let's talk about replacing existing copper infrastructure. Reduce spending while future-proofing your inside and or outdoor cabling plant. Fiberplex solutions deliver gains in network protection, reliability, and longevity while accommodating the ever-increasing demand for more bandwidth. So I've got a very straightforward agenda today. Um, we're gonna get into history and the value proposition, that'll be Buddy. And then uh, we'll get back into why fiber, uh, the eight pillars we call them of, of why you wanna use fiber. Uh, we'll also get into an overview of the Fiberplex solutions themselves, the products themselves. And I've got sample applications peppered in throughout the presentation. And here's Buddy. So hello, thanks uh, for attending today again. Uh, my name is Buddy Oliver. I'm the VP of Business Development here at, at Patton. Um, previously, the president and CEO of Fiberplex Technologies. Um, we're happy now to be uh, consolidated in a brand of Patton. Um, just a quick overview: the the people um, and uh, persons responsible for developing the many of the fiber, uh, Fiberplex brand and, and uh, the whole value proposition and philosophy started uh, working with fiber in the early 60s at a company called Versatron where they, they were, uh, had access to some of the first LEDs uh, ever developed and uh, the first fiber bundles ever developed by Corning. Um, they were tasked to, to figure out how to use those um, components to do some secure communication in and out of some shielded enclosures for the government. Um, in 1987, they left that, uh, the founders of Fiberplex left Versatron and started Fiberplex, uh, where our primary, our sole uh, focus was on defense and the civilian government markets in the US. Um, about 2004, um, I had already been working for the company and we decided to uh, branch out into commercial markets more. And we developed what's called the Light Viper um, line of products, which was developed for uh, the pro audio market, uh, pro AV market, uh, to extend audio over fiber optics. Um, that began our commercial uh, market uh, efforts and also our international efforts. Um, from there, we started to really, once we started exploring the markets, we realized that uh, many of the uh, products we already had also fit into those markets. So in 2011, uh, my partner and I bought the company and we made a, uh, we consolidated the Light Viper and the Fiberplex brands and, and began a real concerted effort uh, to build out commercial applications, commercial products, and, uh, and we began to get into international markets. Um, in October of this year, uh, we've taken the next step and uh, now we've consolidated here with Patton, become a brand of Patton Electronics. Um, and the, the exciting thing is, you know, the, to be able to bring solutions that unify copper and fiber um, together. Uh, we've spent 30 years marketing against fiber, I mean, against copper as a fiber company. Um, uh, but now we, real, we're, you know, this, 
uh, unification, it really has become clear that there's a full spectrum of applications and uh, there's different applications for each. And now um, as uh, consumers of the patent electronics products, you'll have access to not only all of the copper um, copper products that you're used to from patent, but a whole other line of fiber products um, that are Fiberplex brand. Uh, and it's really going to ex uh, expand your toolbox for solving problems. So we're really excited about that. And Kyle's going uh, to hand it back to Kyle to um, step us through the rest. Thank you, buddy. All right, so I want to dig into why fiber. Uh, I'm going to break this out individually as as we get later on into the presentation. Uh, but this slide here is very, very important to focus on as far as the real value behind fiber optic transport for information. Security, distance, bandwidth, noise immunity, isolation, cost, sustainability, and transparency. And we'll dig into those in good depth. So where fiber and the answer is all the way to the endpoints, and it's it's really important to understand that it is anywhere that it can be, all the way to the endpoints that you want to utilize fiber, regardless of your signal type, whether you're working in serial data or audio or telephony or security. When you're dealing with an infrastructure, and it, any of it is copper, you've got a lot of areas of per, or for potential failure or interference. And a lot of times fiber comes to a building, but within the building, it, it, it ends up being all copper in there. And what I'm gonna point out to you is ways both inside and outside plant to be able to utilize our solutions to get fiber all the way to the endpoint, all the way to the desk. And then how fiber, that's 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 a simple one it's it's by adapting to fiber at the interface again if i'm at your computer at your desk i want to convert that signal right there and and maintain fiber th throughout the building um and throughout the network um any type of signal type can be utilized with our products whether you're dealing with your legacy systems like analog pots lines isdn lines t1 lines um, any type of serial data, 422, 232, 422, 485, we convert them all to fiber. Um, Multi-mode and single mode solutions we have. Um, then you get into current solutions like 4K video, 3G video. There's all sorts of connectivity types that we offer and we're gonna get into those as well. When fiber, when you're ready to upgrade your physical plant, definitely do not pull copper. Um, anytime that you can utilize fiber, as I mentioned, even you know all the way to the endpoints, definitely utilize fiber. At the same time, if you're not ready to upgrade your entire copper plant, Patent has solutions for that as well. We have, uh, well, regardless of what your copper infrastructure looks like, we've got the ability of, of converting and transporting information. So anytime you can utilize for optics, use them. So I'm gonna get back into the Y fiber and I'll try to run through these quickly. I've got um, application drawings after each one of these to kind of explain it a little bit more in depth. So looking at security, uh, that's what we've been doing for the past 30 years, selling to the government military primarily. Um, secure, security has been our number one focus because it is the most secure way of transporting information. There's no compromising emanations. You don't have to worry about signals leaking off of your copper wires. Again, copper is a conductive material. So there are signals that are able to be intercepted on your on copper cabling anywhere. Um, Encryption is just not enough. If somebody's able to access your information, chances are they're gonna be able to unencrypt it. Um, so why give them that chance? Let's, let's put it on fiber and keep your information as secure as possible. This is a good example of one of our products, the PKG CCRP. This is a, a custom solution we designed for the government. And what we're doing here is transporting information from a rooftop for satellite communications 
down to a secure bunker in the in the in the basement of an embassy, as an example. Um, this gives us the ability of transporting the telephony, the data for satellite telemetry, and the push to talk functionality while maintaining the secure nature of, of the environment that I'm working in. Talking about distance, distance is oftentimes a, a considered the primary reason why people look for fiber as a solution. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of other reasons to look at, uh, but we measure in miles and kilometers versus feet. Uh, oftentimes, you hear that it's a 300 foot limitation when you're utilizing copper, regardless of the type that you're using, especially when you get into any type of bandwidth hungry information. Um, the challenge with copper for distance applications is the degradation that occurs when you're transporting information over far distances, picking up interference from electrical circuits in the walls and the ceilings, RF interference from tele telephones, um, all, all causes degradation of the signal. But when you're talking fiber, it, it comes down to the power of the laser. So our standard single mode optic that comes with a lot of our products is 20 kilometers distance capable. Um, you can order them a lot of different ways. You can go short distances and order, order less powerful lasers. You can get much more powerful lasers all the way up to 120 kilometers and beyond. Um, so there really is no limitation as far as how far the information can go over distance other than the capabilities of the laser itself. And this is just a good application example. Imagine a, a town where you've got in your police station, fire department, paramedics, you know, set within several miles of one another. Uh, campus security situation occurs. I need to communicate with the police station very quickly and get somebody deployed. Uh, regardless of the distance, since we're traveling at the speed of light, I'm able to get information out and back as quickly as necessary, regardless of the distance that I'm dealing with. Then we get into bandwidth, and this is a big deal, whether it's just fiber optics or whether you look at the modular capabilities of some of the FiberPlex solutions. But with fiber, we have a ceiling that is unknown at the point uh, regarding bandwidth. Uh, right now they're testing petabits and it's it's really just unknown exactly what the capabilities are for fibers bandwidth uh, whereas with copper it tops out at 10 gigs um, and you, you know then you also have to concern yourself with the distance and any kind of degradation there so topping out at 10 gigs is where we are yeah they'll add a couple of twists to different category cables and give you an extra 10 feet or uh, a little bit more bandwidth, but at the end of the day, why limit yourself? Again, if you're if you're building a new infrastructure, do it with fiber and eliminate the ceilings that you would be, normally be concerned with. So this is a really good example of an upgrade path, both for fiber optics and uh, the FiberPlex solutions. Pictured there is the TD6010, which you'll see in more depth a little later on. But this gives us the ability of having displays today that are composite video or standard definition video. Then as we swap out our displays to high definition displays, we can get into 1080p just by swapping out a module, leaving the infrastructure alone, then up to 4K and beyond. Um, so it, the, the ceiling is not there and we have the ability of giving you upgrades with the same infrastructure that's all in place which will tie into cost, which is a couple slides later. Noise immunity is something that I recently had a conversation with a client that had a, uh, a network coming into their building and they were expecting 25 megs up and down and they weren't getting it. And it, they thought maybe it was because of internet traffic alone, but when they did a little bit more diagnosis, they determined that it wasn't the case of just of just bandwidth hungry downloads some of the things that can cause slow uh, network decay is electrical magnetics electromagnetic interference and radio frequency interference so if you imagine and the next slide shows this nicely um, if you imagine working through a multi-story building 
and you're installing a VoIP system, in the process of running cable, you're going to be running past electro uh, or um, fluorescent fixtures. You're going to have hundreds of employees with cell phones. If you're an industrial plant, there will be all sorts of machinery that's generating all sorts of EMI. So there's all sorts of interference in an environment regardless. And when you're dealing with fiber, it, it's completely impervious to that. You don't have to worry about that type of interference, slowing down your network, causing dropped calls. That all goes away, all of those concerns. Uh, this isolation is very closely tied to noise immunity. Um, again, it comes down to the material that's at hand. Uh, copper is a conductive material, um, hence the idea of, of lightning rods. Um, so being that it's a, 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 a conductive material, it's very susceptible to lightning strikes or brownouts, that type of stuff as well. Um, when you're dealing with running fiber, on the other hand, say I'm running from, as you'll see in the next slide, from a server farm to a corporate building or to a campus, and I'm transporting information several, several miles, well, on either end of that fiber, I'm going to have very expensive equipment, whether it be in my server farm, uh, whether it be a, uh, a surveillance system with expensive cameras on either end of it. Um, lightning strikes and you've got copper connected to all them. Well, they are the lightning rod and you can count on losing that equipment. Whereas with with fiber in place, you don't have to worry about that being the case and we'll uh, jump to the next slide. You can see quickly that uh, that that illustrations right there for you. Yeah. And then we can jump on to cost. <clears throat> and obviously, all of these features tie closely to cost. The cost is the one biggest misconception for fiber. Um, in the past, it was a very expensive material, but the material itself is now substantially less expensive than copper. Um, other misconceptions were that it was extremely fragile. So if I'm pulling fiber into a into my infrastructure, I have to worry about it breaking, not being able to bend it too far, all of that type of thing. And that is a misconception at this point in time because fiber actually has 12 times the tensile strength of copper. So you can pull that through a wall much more safely than you would with copper. And then as far as the bending radius, at this point in time, Corning's making fiber that you can tie in a knot. So there's really not too much to worry about there. Um, I'm also gonna show you some examples of where the Fiberplex line of products in particular can really provide some substantial cost savings, as you'll see for my example with Hillsdale College, which is right here. So Hillsdale College was, is a non-federally funded campus that uh, does most of the work around campus via donations. Um, they had fiber in the ground, and but very limited number of fibers, and they were using it solely for their IT network. Um, but the broadcast team on campus, they do a lot of um, political um, broadcasts and streaming uh, from multiple facilities around the campus. So they wanted to tie eight buildings back to one central location. Uh, and the money that they had been donated, which was about 500,000, was going to be put into trenching up the campus. It was gonna take months and months of effort. They were gonna run new fiber and then they'd be able to, to be up and operational. Well, what I was able to do was sit down with IT on one side of the conference room table and the AV team on the other side of the conference room table and help everybody to get along and help IT to recognize that their network was gonna remain untouched, unscathed, a full one gig that they were transporting would remain. We were just gonna add another 48 gigs of bandwidth to the fiber that was already in the ground. So by, prevent, by not having to trench up the campus, by being able to get them up and running in about a week's time, we were able to save them $400,000 and solve connecting eight buildings to one central location for about 100 grand. It's a happy client, to say the least. Still is. 
So sustainability, we all hear green all the time. Um, obviously, copper is not a sustainable commodity and causes a lot of substantial environmental consequences when making it. Uh, whereas with fiber, it, it is environmentally sustainable. It's, it's made out of sand and silica, which we have plenty of. So when you get to um, when you get into green buildings or uh, lead buildings, a lead is a uh, leadership in energy and environmental design. It's one of the most popular green building certification programs worldwide. And if you're involved in a project that is looking to go green, running fiber and having these types of solutions is going to give you that ability. And then we get into transparency and transparency is true to Fiberplex uh, versus many of the competitors in that we're not turning information from one language to another in order for us to be able to transport it over fiber. What we're doing is literally taking electrons and converting them to photons transparently. So what you're putting in is what you're getting out on the other side we're simply converting it to, to light for transport at the speed of light and for all of the other advantages is what we pointed out for distance. And then we hop into the product families. We have seven different product families at the moment in, in the Fiberplex line. Waveguide filters, fiber optic interfaces or FOIs, TD and TIS series, SFPs, which are small form pluggables, FOMs, which are fiber optic modules. You can tell we come from the government space. Everything's got an acronym. Light Viper, which is for audio transport, and our routing series, which is composed of active and passive wave division multiplexers at this point in time. And we'll break these down one by one. By one. Waveguide filters are, <laughs> these individual units are unique to us in that they are patented in the core comes out and allows you to run pre-terminated fiber as you're picturing here. Now what a waveguide filter does is gives you the ability to penetrate a secure environment where you don't want information to leak in or out, but you do need to transport critical information in or out. So if I have an anechoic chamber where I'm testing to see where a, a jet would uh, be inter have inter issues with electrical magnetic pulses. I need to be able to test that cleanly with no external interference, but I still need to get the test results out to my computer in the other room. So with a waveguide filter, I penetrate the wall. This gives me a way of running just fiber through the wall and transporting that information. And the way that it works is like a tunnel. When you drive through a tunnel, you lose radio reception. And when you get about a quarter of the way through, each of the holes on a waveguide filter is bored to a specific diameter to attenuate specific frequencies from being able to travel through it. We get into our fiber optic interfaces, our FOIs. These are simple point-to-point -point solutions. Uh, we have a lot of different variations, whether it be multi-mode or single mode, ST connectors or LC connectors or SC connectors, lots of different connectivity options. But the important thing is here is that virtually any signal type that you can think of, we have the ability for a single channel of an analog POTS line or a single channel ISDN or composite video, you name it, we're going to be able to convert it and transport it over fiber and on the other side, break it back out to its electrical companion. We have a lot of different cha uh, chassis options for this, as well as you can power them independently. We have both AC and DC independent power supplies. The chassis, we have a, a bunch that are all the same size. They can fit nine FOI units, um, or with a redundant power supply, eight, eight FOI units. Um, we also have IP54 rated solutions, as you can see there with our RMC 3700. And this is just a good point to point typical application for a fiber optic isolator or converter or extender, however you want to look at the device. Um, 
again, point to point, single pair of fiber. Uh, we also have certain applications where there's only one strand of fiber available, and we can do that as well. Um, so whether it's your your telephone system, your surveillance system, you name it, single point to point solutions in our FOIs. When you get into our TD series, it's closely related to our FOI series. The FOI series is built out of steel, whereas our TD series are brushed aluminum. Uh, so they're designed more for the commercial market, but we're doing very well with them in the government and military as well. Um, these give you a lot of different uh, installation methods and chassis options that we'll get into. Um, but again, anytime you see one of these devices, whether it be a, uh, a blue and black box, it's, it, it is, we also have an FOI companion. So if you need that more industrial rated version, uh, a TD6010 in the FOI series would be an FOI6010. And here's some of the chassis mounting options. Um, not all of them are illustrated here. There's there's a couple more, but if you take a look at the TDR, it is a single unit, one U chassis that holds up to six power supplies, or I'm sorry, six TD series devices, all powered by a single power supply. There's a tension bar there that locks everything into place, and there's little tabs that, that insert into the TD series box. So it's a really rugged, solid connection. Then when you get down to the TDP, the difference here, if you'll notice on the TDR, there is no connectivity on the front panel. Whereas on the TDP, we have breakouts, so you can have all your IO connectivity right on the front of your rack. Our TD series is derived from the TDP in that we had some clients that would that wanted a lunchbox type of a solution that they could either carry around or, as you can see with the yoke mount, they wanted to be able to mount it up in the ceiling or mount it to a truss. And this gave them the ability of powering six devices um, and having all your connectivity on the inside or outside, but mounting it re remotely if needed. Then we have our NEMA 4X enclosures. That's our TNE series. Uh, we have it, like you saw there, pictured with three. We also have one that holds a, an individual unit. And here's a great example of it. It's actually what what prompted the the design of the TNEs? Um, this was a mine shaft application, and we're going from the guard shack, and we're daisy chaining our switch. That's our 8632 switch, which is a 10 100 1000 auto negotiating switch, but built into it are two SFP ports, so it gives you the ability of daisy chaining the devices. So the way it's pictured here, on a single pair of fiber all the way down into the mine shaft. I was able to extend the surveillance network just by daisy chaining these switches and creating one big network. Obviously in the NEMA 4X enclosure. Then our small form pluggables or SFPs, uh, sometimes you hear them referred to as GBICs. Um, what's uh, unique to ours is that we not only have your optical modules as you see there on the bottom right, but we also have several different options of copper connectivity SFPs. So your RJ45 connectors, your, your BNC connector, and your HDMI connector, those are all high density connectors that you're seeing pictured here. Um, but these give us that upgrade path. They give us the ability of utilizing some of our solutions in a very small form, being able to hot swap and utilize the same product for several different applications as you'll see here shortly. And there it is, the 6010, the TD6010. Again, we have an FOI version of the same thing. This is our Swiss Army knife of a solution. It's the anything in, anything out box. Um, utilizing our SFP modules. Uh, currently, it's rated to 12 and a half gigs, but we're very confident due to the ruggedness of the PC board that it could go well beyond that. We just haven't had the opportunity to test it. But this is, again, anything in, anything out using our SFPs. So I could use it today to transport a one gig network. And tomorrow I could say, hey, we're gonna upgrade to a 10 gig network. And I swap out two modules and now I'm transporting a 10 gig network. The next day I could walk in and say, hey, I wanna uh, transport high definition video over here. 
and I can plug in my HDMI module and our video optimized optical module, and we're doing that. So it's it's a single SKU that gives you a lot of different solutions in one box. Our 7280 is uh, one of our best sellers right now. Uh, it actually came, but we were looking for a device that could give you point to multi-point capability over fiber by being able to daisy chain them. And we were looking at it for a railway situation where they were trying to transport control signals. Um, that's kind of where the idea came from and it turned into the 7280, which is a pair of balanced audio in both directions any type of serial data, RS-232, 422, 485, and a contact closure. So it gives me the capability of turning a system on, controlling that system, as well as getting audio to and from that system. It's also what was used in our PKG CCRP, that earlier slide under security that was used for SATCOM. Because again, you've got your audio for the telephony portion, you have the contact closure relay for your push to talk functionality, and we have our serial data for the telemetry. Our fiber optic modules, our FOMs, um, give you more rack real estate. So that chassis there, the RMC 5000, will host up to 16 of our FOM cards. And a lot of our FOM cards give you four inputs onto a single pair of fiber. So there's, they're basically mini muxes. So I could take four analog phone lines and combine them onto a single pair of fiber. I could take four ISDN lines, combine them onto a single pair of fiber. Um, still point to point types of solutions, uh, but again, gives you, gives you a little bit more capability in a single, in a single box. Um, the SAC1AC is a chassis for a single card. Um, and as you can see it pictured here, it comes with all the hardware necessary to, to mount either a single sack by itself or two of them side by side in a 1U chassis. A nice, nice example of, I actually uh, utilized the same drawing earlier on when I was illustrating to you the uh, electrical magnetic interference and RF interference. Um, this is the design that it came from where I'm taking a Nortel phone system 64 phone lines into our RMC 5000 that's populated with our FOM cards. That's converting it to fiber, and then there's a pair of fiber going to each floor. At each floor, I have a standalone chassis with the FOM card dropping four, four phone lines off on each floor. Our Light Viper series is the only product that was available commercially um, for a very long time until Buddy and Cindy took over the company. Um, but it was, it's a, a really well-known product in the uh, live production world. Um, names like Metallica and um, um, the Red Hot Chili Peppers have toured with it. Um, we even have one that is, was installed in Shamu Stadium before they closed that up um, in San Diego. So it's, uh, it's a 32 by eight audio snake. Uh, it gives me the ability of transporting any type of audio balanced or unbalanced um, from one point to another and as well as daisy chaining capability. So I could go from say it's a conference room or a, a, um, a conference center and we've got multiple halls. I could have all of my audio inputs coming from one location and being distributed to multiple halls. Um, we also have an 8x8 version. The 8x8 gives us 8 in analog or digital, as well as 8 in, 8 out analog and digital. So it gives you a little bit more functionality there, as well as giving you daisy chain capability. This is a great example at uh, Kennedy, uh, Kennedy Space Center for NASA. They had a single strand of fiber available to get from the launch pad back to the to the center for communications. Um, we were able to build our light viper with, a, with an optic that allowed transmit and receive on a single strand of fiber. So we were able to get all of the audio out at the control panel back to Kennedy Space Center. 
Then we get to our routing series, which ties it all together. So we've got a lot of point-to-point -point solutions and some point-to-multi-point -point solutions. When we get into our multiplexers, if you're not familiar with, um, well, let's, let's real quick on this slide, I'll point out that there's active there on the left and passive on the right. And if we can jump to the next slide, I'll give you an understanding of what exactly wave division multiplexing is for, for those that aren't familiar with it. <clears throat> so if you remember in elementary school, shining a flashlight on a prism and seeing the colors refract and give you all the colors of the rainbow. Um, when we're dealing with fiber optics, we're dealing in the IR spectrum, so it's invisible to the human eye. But this paints a really nice picture. Wave division multiplexers have multiple ports. Uh, for these specific ones, they're called coarse wave division multiplexers, and meaning they only go up to 16 individual wavelengths or individual colors on that rainbow. And what we do is we connect a signal or a system to each color on that rainbow or each port on the wave division multiplexer. So using our SFPs or any of our other converters, I can take any type of signal, optical or electrical, plug it directly into the box, and internally we're gonna, there are prisms that are gonna take those signals, all of those individual colors of the rainbow, combine them into a white light, and transport that white light down a single strand of fiber. We get all of the advantages of that fiber. And then on the other side, there's what's called a DMUX prism, which takes those that white light and breaks out the colors again for you. So port one equals port one 10 miles down the road. Um, gives me the ability to take multiple systems. If you take campus connectivity, for example, actually that's the next slide, um, I could have my my digital signage system, my phone system, my blue pole emergency phone system, my surveillance system, all of these systems, each one plugs into an individual port. And then those ports are all combined onto a single output, which is our single pair of single mode fiber. Uh, standard optics that come built into this is for 20 kilometers, so 13 miles. Um, and then on the other side of campus, we break it out to the control room. And this is what we use to maximize the infrastructure that I mentioned earlier at Hillsdale College. So that's how it comes together. And as I mentioned earlier on, we have fiber connectivity solutions for every type of signal that you can imagine. We've got them, got them laid out here nicely for you in an organized fashion, depending on what type of signal you're working with. Um, so if anybody has any questions, please let us know. Okay, so we do have a couple of questions in the queue, um, and we have a, a good amount of time reserved yet, so please, uh, if you have other questions, go ahead and type them down on the bottom right side um, of the interface and you, where you can uh, type in your questions and we'll get to them. Uh, we have one question that says, uh, I was asking about going back to the encryption. Why is the encryption not enough with a strong key? They can uh, gather all they want and it will be completely useless to gather. Well, in a, in a commercial setting, that's true. Uh, remember, we come out of the defense and intelligence world where NSA holds all the keys. Um, and then you have people like Edward Snowden who um, you know are able to slip through, unfortunately. Um, so if you can collect through compromising emanations. I think Kyle mentioned the term compromising emanations, which is the electromagnetic radiation off of the wires, of uh, copper wires radiate, and uh, without even uh, disrupting the wire itself, you can, uh, there's some simple demonstrations. I think there's even some on YouTube, with just a simple coil and oscilloscope, you can recover the data out of the air that's emanating off the copper wires. Um, so if you can collect that data, that gives you plenty of time to go then and decode. You don't have to do it real time. Um, we actually have a, a, a telephone disconnect unit that's used for uh, anti-espionage. Um, and what that does, there's a, there's a way that you can go out to the pole and in, insert a, or inject a high frequency uh, signal. And it'll actually, with an analog phone that's on hook, you can actually jump the hook switch and uh, enable the microphone 
and, and that will be uh, modulated on that highest frequency um, signal and you can actually plug the room. Um, so we have a device that creates an optical um, creates an optical uh, isolation to prevent that. So basically when the phone's on hook, it's like you disconnected it from the wall, uh, but yet it'll still ring. Um, so those are some of the things that we deal with in, this, in that Intel world. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but it was a good uh, prompt. Uh, we have another question. Uh, what speed are you getting with fiber using light as opposed to electron transfer? Um, so literally, um, I think it, the, the real answer has, has more to do with uh, the way that uh, we transport over copper versus fiber. There are some synchronous applications on copper, but for the most part, um, copper transmissions are, uh, are packetized. Um, and and uh, the degradation to the signal, the, the, uh, the actual wave form, happens through uh, capacitance and ductance of the co copper over, over distance. And so then you begin to get uh, bit errors. And when it's packetized, then you lose packets, and then you have to re-request packets and, and those sorts of things. Um, I mean, physics by itself knows that the propagation of electrons through a copper medium is going to be significantly slower uh, than the speed of light. Um, but uh, the, the bigger problem is that the way that copper is used versus fiber, fiber is a straight TDM. So if something needs to move at a gig, we might 10 times oversample it and run it at 10 gigs on fiber, um, just straight TDM. So you're really losing next to nothing. Um, so that, that's sort of the difference. And when it comes to things like uh, T1 and ISDN, where there's uh, reverse timing that's required in order for the, um, to have a valid connection, um, we can extend beyond the, the limits of ISDN and T1 that are limited on copper, and we can extend beyond that on fiber because uh, light is traveling faster than, than the copper. And so we can account for those delays and still be within tolerance uh, by using fiber instead of copper. Um, could there be any interference between the combined signals when combined? I'm, I'm assuming that's referring, that came in kind of late, so I think that was talking about the WDM. And so that's an amazing thing, and it's really hard to, to kind of get your mind around, but the answer is no. There's absolutely no interference, and there's no sacrifice of bandwidth per channel um, if you think about um, having two different color flashlights, uh, a red and a green flashlight, you can hold them together and, and uh, combine those, but at the end of the day, you just turn and they're still green and, and red. Um, there is absolutely no interference uh, between the combined signals like you would have in copper. There's no such thing as crosstalk, um, you know, because the, the wavelength frequencies are centered uh, and then there's enough buffer between them that it's um, there. There is no interference like that, and, and and there's no sacrifice of bandwidth either. There's no shared bandwidth. Every single port on a WDM gets the full entire bandwidth. Um, uh, it doesn't need to be shared. It's, it is sort of a, especially coming from a, a world of telecom and, and copper. It's hard to get your mind around that concept, but uh, that's what makes it so powerful. And I don't think I mentioned that it is three gigs worth of bandwidth per port on a WDM. Um, so, yeah, thanks, Kyle. And then uh, the last question that's up here is uh, how many ranges of wavelengths are used in our WDM? Uh, we do 16. Um, we go up to 1610 on the high end, and I think the low end is... Well, we have the capability of going down to 12.7. We're using what's called coarse wave division multiplexing. Um, which has bigger spacing between uh, the wavelengths of light, um, primarily because it's it's less expensive and for the most of the applications uh, that we encounter, 16 is plenty. Um, there is such a thing uh, that's widely used in the telecom industry, which is DWDM, which is dense wave division multiplexing. Um, in that case, um, I don't even know what the maximum limit is. It's at least 32, if not considerably higher than that, different wavelengths. Um, but it is much more difficult to manage. Uh, the space between wavelengths is much smaller. Uh, and those optics and the uh, passive devices themselves are considerably more expensive. Um, 
So we went with a CWDM of 16 different wavelengths uh, in that applicable range. The optics are easy to get. Um, the passive devices, the MUXs are, are readily available and very reliable. Um, and it just provides a, a good uh, solution. Okay, so what is the speed limitation of fiber as we see it? Is one terabyte per second possible? Yeah, they're actually, like Kyle pointed out, they are um, testing petabits, which is a thousand terabits. Um, now, of course, the, the petabit uh, testing that's being done is using a special kind of fiber that has, uh, we didn't get into a lot of the details of the glass, but it's, it's not just regular glass. There's inside the glass, there's, there's these gradations of different density of glass as you get towards the end, and that's what keeps the light in the middle. So those petabit tests are under some very constrained uh, con uh, conditions, uh, and they're also using some WDM to get those sort of data rates. But yeah, I mean, that terabit is easy. Um, now, in terms of the optics themselves and the lasers, right now, uh, terabit optics, I don't even know if they exist. Um, but it wasn't that long ago that the thought of doing 100 meg Ethernet, uh, I mean, uh, 100 gig Ethernet, uh, was ludicrous. Um, but that's that's commonplace now. Um, so I, I think you know that's where things are moving. Uh, right now, the number one limitation in fiber is the is the lasers themselves getting lasers and receive, receivers that can operate that fast. Um, but you know we've seen over the last couple of decades how fast technology moves, um, and I'm, I'm sure in the future we'll see things moving much faster. Uh, the last question that just popped up is, can we have a presentation? Yes, we're gonna um, we're gonna this is being recorded and we're gonna have it up. Uh, we'll be sending out links to the attendees um, shortly after the presentation, uh, where you'll be able to download and review it. And are we making the PowerPoint available? Yeah. And we're making the PowerPoint available as well. Um, and of course, any further discussion, questions, comments, uh, any, anything that you need to ask, uh, you can shoot email into salesandpatent.com. Uh, we will get your uh, questions answered. Um, it's, it's For some of you, this is all new. Others of you, this is old hat. Um, but... Uh, the exciting thing is, is this partnership um, and the ability to uh, combine both copper and fiber technologies and have that as one big portfolio uh, that's available. You can solve any sort of connectivity problems uh, with patent now, all at a one-stop shop. Um, and um, any other questions? We're, we're a little bit early. We do have time. Um, Let me take a last call. Okay. Well, with that, I think we'll go ahead and uh, close out this webinar. And as uh, Buddy had mentioned, please feel free to email salespatent.com if, if you have any questions. And be on the lookout for uh, more FiberPlex announcements uh, coming in the next few months. And uh, we'll have the presentation to you all shortly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for joining me.